the goal of the lecture is that he have an understanding of the potential future of enterprise computing, because we think we can offer some fundamental changes, that you understand the foundations of um, next generation database storage techniques, that you understand in memory database operators and get a feeling for why this is so different to in comparison to disk-based databases. We'll talk about some advanced database storage techniques and we will look into a few applications so that you get a glimpse of uh, why do we ad achieve factor 100, 1000, 10,000. Record currently is 250,000 times faster execution time than before. This is the starting point of this endeavor. Five and a half years ago, I got pretty bored by the previous uh, lecture, which uh, was around an application, the infrastructure of an application called by design, it's an SAP product. The reason was it was not interesting enough for the students from a technology point of view. We want to teach technology here or not new enough, so I saw in the eyes of the students at that point in time, why is he not talking about Google? Why is he not talking about modern internet applications? Um, probably ERP is a little bit boring. Yes, it's uh, administration to a large extent. But it was also the style of the lecture not interesting enough. So we came together and I proposed that we do something different. With um, all my assistants, um, we had a whole day session. And the idea was to develop a new enterprise system. Let's build a new one. If we start today, so five and a half years ago, what is different? And what was different was it was clear there are two major trends in hardware up and coming. This is massive parallelism with multi-CPU boards and multi-core CPUs. And the other trend was an increasing number or increasing size of the DRAM per board or per CPU and then per board. If this was the trend, then this has an impact on software. Parallelism was only used in transactional systems for the multi-user setup. Yes, we use the parallelism to run hundreds and thousands, and in some case, in cases, 10,000 and 100,000 users on a system. And internet systems are now even running much higher numbers. But we never really exploited parallelism inside an application. It's not that easy to program. Um, when you check a famous uh, computer science book by Hennessy and Pedersen, and you check for parallelism, and there is a small chapter. Parallelism is not easy to achieve. You have a good chance when you find a long, um, sec a straightforward sequence in a program doing the same thing for quite a while that you can chop this up and run it in parallel and then put the result back together in the end. So this is basically all what you can find in the leading uh, computer science book. There is more parallelism in math in um, people who are uh, using math models uh, for weather calculation, weather forecasting, and other applications. They run parallel for 20 plus years. But as I said, it's not easy to program. So that was the starting point, and this is the drawing. Uh, you cannot really decipher what it is. I explained to the computer science students or PhD candidates an ERP system and specifically within an ERP system an accounting system. And these are the numbers and to, to get a feeling, well, what are we talking about? Um, 
And then we, we made two decisions, probably three, but the, the first one, we want to build a new system. Unfortunately, the computers are still not large enough to run large companies. So first decision was, okay, then we run only small companies. This is a privilege of um, academia. You, you can choose the target. You don't have to make money with it. So it's very easy to say, okay, we, we go only for small companies. What's the matter? Over time, I knew from experience, the technology will develop. We will get even more cores. We will get more CPUs. We will get more parallelism. And we will get more DRAM, more memory. So the problem of size will more or less be solved by the hardware guys. The second one is we want to exploit in memory. We don't want to access disk anymore. It is already 2006. So that was a few years earlier that Mr. Gray from Microsoft previously digital said uh, disk is yesterday's tape. That was the topic of an NSA he, a paper he wrote on declaring that in the future we will use disk only for archiving and not for operations anymore. When I started with SAP in 1972, it was the disk which gave us the opportunity to have direct access to data and build systems of the type of, uh, the type of systems we build. We called them real-time systems. They were not quite real-time, but from a, a business perspective, they were real-time, so response times in less than a second. And based on the fact that we could have direct access to disk, but we will see in a few minutes how slow disk is and how much it's hampering us in the last 40 years to develop applications um, of a completely different nature. So the first objective was we don't go back to disk anymore except for archiving purposes. Archiving and backup and recovery. So all operations have to take place on DRAM, in memory. Any computing is any, anyway only taking place inside the CPU. So the term in memory computing is uh, a little bit redundant. Computing is only a definition in a CPU and therefore in memory. Marketing people are a little bit slow to understand the distinction. And then I was explaining, it took a whole day, I was explaining how this accounting system works and that I had this idea that we basically work as much as possible on transactional data, on the original transactional data. And, but for performance purposes, I still intended to have one level of aggregation. And my great innovation was instead of aggregating accounting data on a monthly base, I proposed to do it on a daily base. And Jan Schaffner said, after a while, I have to shorten this, after a while, how much can we compress data by aggregation? So what, what is the size of the aggregation um, with regards to the transactional event data? And I said, it's probably a reduction of a factor 10. So if we have um, 100 gig transactional data, then we need 10 gig for aggregates. And he thought for a second and said, quote unquote, from an academic point of view, this is not very exciting. And that was plus minus his, his quote. And I said, okay. You're right, we even dropped those. So that was the day, based on these numbers there, um, that we made the next major decision. Not only keep, we keep everything in memory, we do not 
heap aggregates. At least not from a design perspective. If we introduce them later again for other reasons, fine, but not as a aggregation of transactional data for performance reasons. That was probably the biggest step away from a 40-year history. Everything I have ever done in my life was based on aggregates. It was unthinkable to build an accounting system, a sales system, a materials management system without aggregates. Aggregates are actually the application. When you take the aggregates away, there, there is not so much in the application left. So that was a very radical step. Um, easy, again, in academia to do this. So we just said, no aggregates. So anything we do, we have to do with SQL. We run the SQL algorithms. We build views. We aggregate data on demand, on the fly, and hope that works. So instantly, there is the question, is that fast enough? Can this work? And yes, we started projects, bachelor projects, uh, to test this. All kinds of projects we started to get a feeling. Is this technically possible? Is this feasible? Today, five and a half years later, we can say unbelievable things are feasible. In most cases, it's clearly superior not to use aggregates, but to do aggregation on demand. And you have to understand, hopefully you will, why this is possible using an in-memory database based on columnar store instead of a row-based database on disk.